This episode contains descriptions of domestic abuse as well as spoilers for Thor Ragnarok. If you're not comfortable hearing about abuse, or you somehow still haven't seen Thor Ragnarok, please skip this episode, and we hope to have you back in the next. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. And we're asking the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? All right. Hey, everybody. We're going to jump into our Good Human of the Week segment, which uh, is something new we're doing this season. And the goal of this segment overall is just to kind of highlight people in the world that are doing good without the motivation of God or religion. Susie, I'll let you introduce our guest since you were the one that made contact with her and then we'll get it going. Today we have Kristen who runs a kitten sanctuary. We're both in the same atheist women's group on Facebook and she had made a few posts in that group about how she was saving kittens over here but then the people in her comments were just going on 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 about how it was Jesus saving the kittens and God and this and that and she was kind of frustrated about how God was getting all the credit for the work that she was doing. (laughs) Welcome, Kristen. I'm so happy that you're here to talk to us. Thank you so much for having us. And I will say, I I look for your comments now on my page. And (laughs) I do, and they stand out for me as well as a couple of the other women in the group because I I very much so appreciate them uh, (laughs) because the other comments do tend to uh, give credit to a a deity when you know I'm the one getting up every two to three hours. (laughs) Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this and and what exactly you do? So I was in high school working at a veterinary clinic just part time, and there were two bottle baby kittens that came in, and uh, you know they were like, well, we don't know what we're going to do with them. We we may have to euthanize, which is really a reality that a lot of rescues face because they are intensive work. And I was like, well, I I can help. I I can take over here and. It didn't go well because I didn't know what I was doing at the time. But that is really when I decided that this is sort of a niche that I wanted to get into. And so when the next round came, um, of course, I was 17. So I snuck these two kittens home and put them (laughs) in my closet. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah, they kind of hid there. And um, by the time they uh, they were old enough to come out, my mom was like, uh, what? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about the sanctuary and like yeah. what all is involved with like what you do. Sure. So I specialize in the neonatal kittens, which are zero to four weeks of age, um, ones that are abandoned by their mothers and require that intensive care. I do occasionally take in kittens that are older that require, um, you know, very specific medical care. Um, but really what we do is we, we take these kittens in with the hope that we will get them to that stage where they're weaned. We can, um, you know, spay and neuter them. That is very important. Um, That is a big part of what we do is making sure that they can't reproduce. Um, You know, kitten season is very ugly and it would be great if I didn't have bottle babies ever again, because, you know, the reality of this is that kitten season is not cute. And there's a lot of heartbreak and compassion fatigue that hits you when you are in the midst Mm -hmm. of this crisis, if you will, of these overburdened, overpopulated shelters and rescues and fosters. And this is volunteer work. We don't get paid. This is our own free time. And it's just something that I try to reinforce that it's not cute and that it is not just the rescuers and the fosters responsibility to kind of take care of this. It's a community problem. And that is something right. that I, I try to advocate for on my page. That That's sort of an education piece. But my goal is really just to try to do what I can with these kittens that otherwise probably would be euthanized. Um, which again, I, I cannot judge shelters that do that because of how much work I know goes into it. But they're here. I know what I'm doing. I, I have the resources and the time. And that is really just my goal to to try to get these kittens into a permanent home. So you don't believe in God, correct? I, I do not. <laughs> why do you do this? Why are you good? Why do I do this? I guess, why not, right? Um, yeah. It's just something that I want to do. I I feel like I can make an impact. It's something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I guess I've never thought about why. 
When COVID hit, I moved into a work from home status. And so I would, now I was trapped in my house and I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> and that was sort of messing with me mentally a little bit. So I was like, I have to do something more. In a way, it, it was like not just me saving them, but they kind of saved me too. Yeah. What you're kind of getting at is the idea of like doing good and being good. It's something that's innate to most people. And we need people like you to do that kind of thing in the world. And your motivation doesn't have to be this like external. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this, you know, external motivation. It's because there's something inside you that says, here's a creature or creatures that are suffering. I'm going to do whatever I can to ease that suffering, to help them survive, to get them into homes where they're going to be loved and cared for. It's the easing the suffering part is, is what it's all about, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's just something about them not having a voice. I have taken in kittens that have literally been discarded in plastic bags and trash cans. And mm -hmm. it, there's just something about that that really gut punches you. How do you not do something? Well, and if it doesn't gut punch you, like what kind of person are you? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm happy that we have people like you, Kristen, in the world because even though I love cats, I don't know if I could do what you do. Because like you said before, it's that constant heartbreak and compassion fatigue. I don't know. How do you deal with that like constant disappointment? Yeah. yeah. So I compartmentalize a lot. I, you know, I put that heartache and that grief in a box and I don't touch that box. Like I just, I have to in order to keep going on. I remember when I lost my, my first foster, I cried myself into a migraine mm. and I was like, okay, I either have to figure out how to handle this or this is just not going to work. Right. Therapy. I, I am a big advocate for therapy for everyone, even if you're doing well. Mm -hmm. The other important piece is finding, you know, your friends in the community. I, I have a lot of uh, friends in the rescue and roster realm that we chat every day just to vent um, and just to speak that language. And sometimes it's, you know, that dark humor that other people would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> So right now you have a GoFundMe going for incubators. Can you talk a little bit about what the incubators are and why you need them, why they're so important to your rescue? Sure. So what the incubators do, uh, we're looking for a medical grade one. And what they allow us to do is help to regulate the humidity and the temperature for these kittens. So the ones that we work with are not able to regulate their body temperature. And they require consistent high temperatures until they're about three to four weeks old. And without that, um, heat is the most important factor in keeping these kittens alive. If they are not um, adequately warmed and consistently warmed, they can't digest their food. If they can't digest their food, they can't absorb the calories. And that's where everything starts going downhill. So that incubator is incredibly important to maintaining their body temperature and to making sure they they are stable. So that incubator is really a critical tool that fosters and rescuers use to help thermoregulate these kittens to give them the best chance of surviving. And you can't mix litters when they come in. So that's why you need more than one incubator, right? That is a very good point. Yes. So we have very strict quarantine protocols. Um, there are things in the community, the one of um, one of the worst is panleukopenia, which can absolutely devastate foster homes and shelters. It is highly contagious and very, very fatal. All of our new intakes undergo a mandatory 14-day quarantine. So mm -hmm. the five bottle babies I have up in my incubator right now, if I got new intakes, I would have nowhere to put them because I right. could not compromise my five bottle babies now um, for the, the new intake. So that's where we're stuck. We need more incubators to safely quarantine kittens so we can continue to help save as many lives as possible. What's like one thing you would want people to know about your rescue and why it's important? Sort of the, the work that I do is, I don't want to say a consequence of the problem, <laughs> right? Oh, there goes my kid coughing. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> like they like sneak down and I'm like, go away. Um, the, the neonatal kittens I take in are a consequence of the problem though, because that means that we may not have enough resources in the community going out and spaying and neutering the cats that are out there. Um, and those are the cats that should be priority. 
that's where the stop gap is. That's where we stop this suffering. We have to get out in the community and stop it at the source. So I would say really the most important thing is, yes, definitely, like, I would love all the support in the world, but go to the source and really support those TNR groups as well. What should I know about if I come across a, a neonatal kitten in the trash? So if you come across uh, a neonatal kitten and you're out in your community and you don't know what to do, the most important thing is to just keep it warm. Um, most folks don't know how to feed a neonatal kitten. There are very specific ways to do so. If you feed it on its back, it could aspirate. If you feed it too fast, it could aspirate. So the most important thing you can do is just keep that kitten warm before you can get it to a rescue. And you're in what part of the country? You're in the Northeast? Yep. So we are in Pennsylvania. We are right near Hershey Park. So all of the chocolates. Okay. Um, <laughs> we serve Central PA. So where can our listeners find you on Facebook if they're interested in, in learning more about you? Sure. So we are on Facebook as the Kitten Sanctuary. There are two. One's Australian based. So watch out for that. Sometimes <laughs> I get tagged in like, we're in Sydney, Australia, and we need you to help <laughs> this kitten. And I'm like, ah, I would love to help. However, <laughs> um, <laughs> it is the kitten sanctuary um, in the United States. Last year, between two of our bottle baby fosters, we had 81 bottle babies between 30 different litters. Wow. wow. Yeah. So lots of long nights. <laughs> yeah, your typical yeah. night, I'm sure, is very fragmented. I did not wake up that much to feed my own children when they were right. that <laughs> <Yes>. little. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I don't see Jesus coming down to help you. No, uh, yeah, that's, right. that, that always cracks me up. I'm like, I have never seen him put his sandals on to come down and help me bottle feed. <laughs> right. <laughs> the sandals. Yeah, the sandals. It's fantastic. Well, Kristen, thanks uh, for being on. Thank you for being yeah, a, thank you. a good human. Um, because I think that we need to really highlight people like you in the world that are just out there doing things that like some of us are just not equipped to do. Like, like yeah. you have a passion, you have a, like a motivation that deserves to be celebrated and applauded. So thank you for what you do. And we will do our best to get the word out about you. And, and thanks for being here. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad that uh, Suzanne reached out and we were able to connect. Thank you, Kristen. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Today, we are going to have kind of a fun topic. Fun. Well, no, I guess it's not. Wait, you think this is fun? No, I guess fun is the wrong word. Um, we're going to have, a, I guess, maybe a topic that is, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't even think of what. It's definitely not fun. No, it's not fun. I th I think. Morose. <laughs> serious. Yeah, maybe it is. It's a serious topic, but we're, we're going to kind of make it hopefully entertaining, I guess. We'll make it a little lighthearted. That's our style. Our style is lighthearted. Yeah. Try to make it a little bit lighthearted, but we've, we've titled this one. Oh, I don't know if we've ever explained this. It just dawned on me. So Susie and I are both like friends, lunatics, right? The show friends. We've explained that. Have we? Okay. Well, well we are obsessed with the show. And the, the reason that our titles of the show are the one with dot, 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 or because that's how they labeled the Friends episode. So we're calling this one the one with the bad boyfriend, because we're going to talk about how Christians say that what they believe is not a religion, but a relationship, which is poppycock. But we're going to more <laughs> delve into the idea of if it was a relationship, it's not a healthy one, and that there's a lot of parallels between an abusive human relationship and the relationship that someone has with God. Yeah. It, this is something that I never noticed when I was actually a, a Christian. Me neither. The more that I dig into this, the more shocked I am at the similarities, even more shocked by some of the Christian responses to these similarities. So we'll get into that. Right. Yeah. I think the first time I heard this concept was actually in another podcast, which I, I think I've mentioned before, the Born Again Again podcast. Yeah. They did an episode that was about abusive relationships and the parallels. And I was like, how have I never noticed that? And I worked, oh, in, I, know. I worked in mental health. Like I have a degree in clinical psychology. Yeah. You should have seen it. I should have seen those parallels. So we're going to kind of dig into them before we do that. Let's talk about the whole idea of religion versus a relationship. When you hear someone say it's not a religion, it's a relationship. What's the first thing that like comes to your mind? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that a relationship is a two-way thing and this is not a two-way thing. That's what comes to my mind first. Yeah. That, when you're in a relationship with someone, 
there's a two-way communication. There's mutual respect. There's a give and take. Admiration and care for each other. There's a lot of things that a real relationship has that Christianity doesn't have. So the idea of people using the word relationship is, to me, just feels like a I don't know. It feels like a scapegoat type of thing. It's a way to try to like make their religion seem superior. We're the right way. What we have is a relationship. What those other versions of even versions of Christianity have, well, that's religion. The Catholics have religion. The Lutherans have religion. Yeah. It's a way of paving over all those criticisms that people have about religion, organized religion, and saying, no, no, we don't ascribe to any of that. Ours is more special. Ours is more direct. Ours supersedes that. Ours transcends that. Right. If anything, it's like a fantasy relationship. Like yep. I read all the Harry Potter books, but I don't have a relationship with J.K. Rowling. It might feel like you know yeah. these people or the characters in a book or whatever, but you're not in relationship with them. You just are part of reading a story, you know? So yeah, I, I agree that there's no difference between the relationship with Jesus and a relationship with any imaginary being that you can create in your own head yeah if you think about that being long enough in fact there's a reddit post about a guy who invented a character in his own head that was like a giant cockroach <laughs> and he fell in love with this cockroach and even had sex with the cockroach oh, in fun. his head and it felt so real to him that he thought he was married to it and he would talk to people about it and he thought this cockroach deserved the same respect as actual people right I don't know if this was a troll or not, but it seemed so much like the relationship with the Christian God mm -hmm. or with Jesus. It had so many similarities that it just it was kind of eye opening that, mm. oh, this relationship could be totally inside, so inside somebody's head and they could think it's real and it feels real to them, but it's not real. Right. What your mind can create as reality isn't an indicator of what reality really is. Yes, you said it just there. Yep. And to me, the, the biggest difference between like a real relationship and the Christian relationship is communication. Yeah. The communication that you have in a relationship is two-way communication. In Christianity, the communication you have is all one way. They might beg to differ on that. Yes, they absolutely would beg to differ, which is I was going to talk about how they <laughs> will say it's not two way. They would say, well, I hear from God through the Bible. Then that's not a relationship. <laughs> right. That's the same thing as I heard from J.K. Rowling from Harry Potter. Or I heard from God through my pastor or spiritual authority. Again, that's still one way communication and there's no real communication there. You're just taking what the pastor says as, oh, God told them this. Like, And if God did communicate to people and if it was a reliable method of communication, then different faith leaders and people would not be getting different messages right. from God because they, they do. They all believe different things. Right. I don't know if you've seen any of the like Mormon documentaries or there's a show that was on some channel called Under the Banner of Heaven. They kind of dig into this where the prophets of that time who were after Brigham Young and after Joseph Smith, well, the prophet decided that he need, he wanted to bring back polygamy. So he just decided, well, I'm going to tell the people I had a revelation from God that says God wants us to bring polygamy back in the, in the Mormon faith, in the Mormon tradition. And so- because the people are conditioned to take whatever the prophet says as God's voice, well, magically polygamy is back. Right. But you know what Christians would say? Oh, but that's not God talking to him. You know, that's they're Mormons. Right. <laughs> this argument that we're talking about right now, this wouldn't convince any Christian because they would just say, oh, but God's talking to me. Right. I, I have the direct line to God. Right. These other people who say different things, they're the ones who don't have the direct right. line to God. Yeah. There's a lot more we could say about the idea of Christianity not actually being a relationship, but that's not really the point of this whole episode. Let's, for the remainder of this episode, let's go ahead and suspend our disbelief about relationship and say, okay, okay. <laughs> your Christianity is a relationship. Yep. And, oh, no, God is real and you have a relationship. Right. Let's talk about if it's a good relationship or a bad relationship. So we're going to take some of the um, red flags from human abusive relationships and we're going to talk about them in human terms. And then we're going to kind of compare them to God and how Christians interact with God. So and what's interesting is that a lot of abusive relationships start out great. At the start of a new relationship, it's not always easy to tell if it will later become abusive. 
Um, many abusive partners seem like ideal partners in the early stages. And so those signs, they don't um, always appear right away. And that is kind of what we see in churches. They, they lure you in with these promises of hope and forgiveness and love. And uh, you don't realize what's really lurking beneath the surface until you get a little more hooked in there. You get a little more intertwined with the congregation. You, it's not easy to leave. That's when they kind of show you who they really are. Yeah, it's like the whole honeymoon period when you're in a relationship with someone. You don't want to see the flaws because they're meeting some need that you have. And you're like, oh, I don't want to dig into it. I'm just going to I'm going to overlook. Some yeah, overlook it. Yeah. So there's kind of a list of a few things, and we're going to expand on this list. These are red flags in human relationships. And the Bible really is the most damning piece of evidence <laughs> yeah. to prove this stuff. Like when we start comparing the human red flag, we're going to actually use the Bible <laughs> to make the point today. Yeah, I think we're going to try not to dwell too much on the Bible verses, maybe summarize where we can no. so it doesn't take forever. Yeah. One of the first ones you see in the human red flag world is the abusive party will say, well, you're nothing without me. Or any value you have is because of me. Right. And you see this in Christianity. Jesus's words. <laughs> yeah. It's straight from Jesus. Yeah. In John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. There's, I mean, just look at how Christians respond to things in general. They're always talking about how they're broken, how they're nothing, how yeah. they're forgiven, and how uh, I could never do this without God. Why don't you tell your phlebotomist story? Oh, yeah. That you told me earlier. Oh, this fits directly into that. You're right. Yes. I got a blood draw the other day, and I barely even felt it when she stuck the needle in my arm. She was done in like four seconds. And so I, I wanted to pay her a compliment, right? Like, I'm a people person. I want to <laughs> make her feel good about her job. So yeah. I said, wow, you are really good at this. And she said, no, God is good at this. And I, I was like, well, did I hear that correctly? And I just kind of looked at her, kind of stunned. And she must have seen my blank expression because she, she said, God is good at this. It wasn't me. It was God. Right. Like God did not put you what? through phlebotomy school. And the idea that God would care enough to intervene somehow to make my blood draw experience a little more comfortable and less painful. Meanwhile, ignoring all the kids who are being abused, right. traumatized, raped, right. died in wars, right. being starved in Somalia. I, it just the idea of it is so ludicrous. But of course, I said nothing to her. Yeah, I can't understand someone that thinks so low of themselves that they did the yeah. work to draw your blood, which again, is not easy takes training. It's it's not something that everybody can do. She was so uncomfortable with the idea of you praising her for her skill. Yes, that she had to deflect it to God. She deflected. Yes. She's been trained to do that. She's been indoctrinated yeah. to never accept praise and give him all the glory for everything, even what she's done. I mean, we just talked about it with Kristen. Yeah. Whenever a human does something, they have to give God the credit. Right. And then think about if, like, if you put that into a human relationship that you always have to give your partner the credit for it, mm. it has such a cringe factor. Like, imagine you're out to dinner with your husband and let's say you accomplish something really great at your job. Like you got some kind of award or something like that. And then someone says, oh, Susie, you did a really great job on that presentation at work or whatever. And then you immediately said, oh yeah, but my husband really was really supportive and he helped me with the PowerPoint or whatever. Makes me cringe. If you heard your friends say that in her relationship, you would be like, ew, that's gross. I'm uh -huh. trying to give you the compliment. You did it. Yeah. You did the work. That is the very basis of the Christian's relationship with God. It's I'm nothing. He's everything. He must increase. I must decrease. Mm, yeah. That's right. straight from the Bible too. You know, what's the second red flag? Oh, what's going to happen if you try to leave me? Oh, bad things will happen. And if you've ever heard any stories about women or men who have been in abusive relationships, they will tell you the horrors of like, I knew I had to get out of there, but I was terrified. Threats of physical violence. Right. People stay in abusive relationship for all kinds of reasons there, and they're stuck there because they cannot leave. Well, that verse that I just read for the first red flag about the vine and the branches and bearing fruit, apart mm. from me, you can do nothing. Well, Jesus continues that in the next verse, and he says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Yowzers. Yeah. <laughs> what? That's love, friends. Yeah. That's what I tell my wife if she won't 
stick around and we're like, well, I'm just going to toss you into the fire. Yeah. But there's more. Yeah. Deuteronomy, the, you know, talks about that if you're going to leave and go worship other gods, that you should be stoned. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. Stone, stone to death. Which I, I find ironic too, just the whole idea of like, if you're the one true God, what do you care if people go worship the other gods? If you're real, then they should realize, oh, this other God sucks. I'm going to go back to the real God. Because he's jealous and we'll get to that. That's another red flag. Yeah. We'll get to that too. But, but, when we talked about in a previous episode about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit about the verse um, that pertains to that, but what we didn't talk about is the second part of that verse, which I had never seen before, and it's actually quite disturbing. So the verse is, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness and then it continues, a dog returns to its vomit. Oh. So if you leave, don't come back don't. because once you come back, you're as bad as a dog who throws up, then leaves and comes back to eat it again. Right. What's interesting about that is like how many people that have walked away from faith, the Christians are all trying to get us to come back. But if they read their own Bible, they would know it's only going to be worse for us if we come back because... Your Bible yeah, says crazy. we shouldn't come back. The Bible says it. It says we shouldn't come back. It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness. So this is also similar to the whole idea of why missions is so flawed. Because like, mm -hmm. if you never heard, you're not destining people to hell. Right. You should just leave them alone. You're going to be made to feel like you're making a horrible mistake by leaving Christianity, just like you would be told in an abusive human relationship. Right. And it, the abusive partner might tell you how scary the world is on the outside and how you're worse off if you leave, just in the same way as, as what you're saying. Churches say that all the time about the outside world. You know, don't be of the world. If you leave, you'll become a drug addict. You'll become a porn addict. Mm -hmm. You'll lose your job. You'll, you'll lose your spouse. You'll get divorced. Yeah, definitely a red flag. Yeah, red flag. For Christianity. So that, that's two red flags. What's the next one? Red flag number three, you don't deserve me and you are not worthy of my love. So how does this present itself in a human relationship? I've never been in an abusive relationship that I know of. Except for with God. Yeah, except for the one with God. But I can't even fathom how a person would say this to someone that they supposedly love. If we were in a relationship and I said to you, you don't deserve me, I, I'm too good for you. I'd say, okay, well, I guess we don't have to be together then. <laughs> yeah. Like, I guess, <laughs> I guess solved. it comes out in the way of saying, well, you're, you're never going to find somebody as good as me. Like, again, it goes back to the trying yeah. to leave. Right. Trying to leave. Yeah. You see this in the Bible too. And in Christianity, there's like, just we're sinners, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah. Every inclination from the human heart is evil from childhood. Like from childhood. Yeah. <laughs> from That's... childhood, you know? Oh, oh. And then the, the famous filthy rags. Those are menstrual rags. Right. Did you know that? I it's, did. I didn't realize that until yeah. uh, recently. Which is also a subtle, you know, misogynist uh, yes, exactly. thing too, but we'll get to that later too. One who is unclean. Yeah. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Yeah. Oh, and then I found a Got Questions article talking about this. They say humanity is totally depraved. That is, all of us have a sinful nature that affects every part of us. The question is, where did that sinful nature come from? We are born with a sinful nature and we inherited it from Adam. Yeah. And this is the whole idea of original sin. And we believe that kind of stuff as Christians. Like, yeah, well, of mm -hmm. course my kid is being terrible. He's a sinner. I'm a sinner and mom's a sinner. And so, of course, why wouldn't this child be yeah. a horrible human being? Because it's a sinner and it doesn't, hasn't accepted Jesus yet. Like big red flag. The idea that someone tells you that you're worthless and you're a sinner and that the only way that you can obtain love is by staying with me. Big red flag. Red flag number four, you brought this on yourself. You made me do this. In the human world, if you've ever seen TV shows or whatever, where they depict domestic violence, or if you know someone who's been a victim of domestic violence, they will, it seems like they always tell the story that the, the abuser is always remorseful right after and they'll, they feel really bad about it. But then they'll also do like victim blaming where like, if like, you, did, you made, you me, made do. me do this, you made me so angry. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. And so I had to hit you. Yeah. So it's your fault for pissing me off. Right. It's not the abuser's fault. It's the victim's fault. And you see that in a lot of abusive relationships yeah. on the human side. And it's the same thing on the Christian side. Like you're the sinner. You need me. You had this coming. Red flag number 
What are we on? I don't know. We didn't number these. I think it's, we didn't number I think these. it might be number five. Red flag number five. So this is kind of related to the last one. I only do this because I love you, as if that somehow excuses the action of abuse. Yeah. And this is true not only in like abusive romantic relationships, but this is something you see in child abuse situations. Like, yeah, I, I remember hearing that exact phrase from my parents before getting spanked. Oh, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I beg to differ. No, I doubt that. Because if that's the case, let me hit you with the belt or the hanger. Yeah. And so the idea that discipline is supposed to be painful and that pain is a sign of love is completely unhealthy. And it makes perfect sense when you see Christian relationships that one of the parties won't leave and they know they're in an abusive situation. It makes perfect sense because they've been taught that pain equals love. Yeah, it primes them to stay in an abusive relationship for sure. Because pain is is how you know that someone cares. Are you. What was the thing you said about, I think in another episode, you were talking eye about drops. eye drops. You're like, oh yeah, the burning is how you know it's working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse five says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. But there's a difference between healthy discipline and the kind of discipline that the Lord engages in right. in the Old Testament and, and in the New Testament, yeah. really. It's completely different. I mean, there are healthy ways to discipline people. Right. There's a difference between discipline and abuse. Absolutely. It's not even really a fine line. Discipline is something that teaches you something. Abuse doesn't teach you shit, except yeah. for to be afraid. Pain. I saw someone just post today. I forget where it was, but they were talking about how hell isn't even a punishment that yields a result. Correction. Yeah. Because you can't. Exactly. You can't rehabilitate. Right. You're in hell for all of eternity. You haven't learned anything. You ho don't have an opportunity to rehab. You're. It's just the fear of hell. That's supposed to keep you in line. Yeah. And that's the same thing an abusive partner or an abusive parent does. Yeah, it's that threat of, it's that fear that's always hanging over you and keeping you in line. I only do this because I love you. Red flag. Yeah. Um, next one is, I know best. Ooh, I know best. <laughs> I know better than you. I, I know everything. I like this one because I feel like this is the one that gets thrown at my face the most mm. by people on the internet and people in my life. Yeah. As a child, I heard this verse so much. Do not lean on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We can't possibly comprehend the greatness of the Lord. If something doesn't make sense, it's because of you. It's not because of him. <laughs> right, right. I, there was a post in the um, Young Earth Creation group where someone said, oh, well, you can't use the tools of science to understand what God does because he knows better than us. He's He, he knows more than us, so we can't hope to understand it. So you can't use the tools of science to try to understand God. That's like a that's like a pure gaslighting technique. You don't allow someone to think you lord control over them because you know better than they do. Right. And there it could be true. If there is a God, I am sure that God knows way more than we do. Like I'm not disputing that. Sure. But it's the way that you lord that wisdom, quote unquote wisdom, over the party who does not possess the wisdom. Right. It creates that inequity, that's that gap. And God is actively trying to keep us down there without wisdom. Right. He wants he wants to be the one with all of the wisdom. And he wants to keep us down here where we don't question. You know, we keep looking up and wonder, like, oh wow, yeah. what a wonderful, amazing, wise God. Right. Well, and abuse is always about power and control. A lot of people don't understand that someone who that is a perpetrator of sexual abuse is not doing it for sex. They're doing it for power. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. Like God is doing it for power. And the thing that we do as humans when we were Christians is we're consistently giving away the power and viewing it as virtue. You're saying his ways are higher than my ways voluntarily. We're voluntarily giving away the yeah. power and saying, oh, well, God knows better than we do. So even if this doesn't make any fucking sense, even if my five-year-old child just died, I'm going to go ahead and say, God knew better. Yeah. That's abuse. That is not that is not yeah. a healthy relationship. Yeah, you mentioned the other the verse about trusting in the Lord and not leaning on your own your own understanding. And then the next part of that verse is in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Which that's just like a weird thing that doesn't even make sense. Like who cares about if your path is straight or if it has a turn in it? But <laughs> like, who cares? But in everything that you do, your whole everything is tied up in the other person, which in yeah. an abusive codependent 
relationship, that's exactly how it is. Your whole identity is tied up in that other person. And right. you will take anything that that person gives you because you think that they're smarter than you, wiser than you, but really it's because they're more powerful than you. And this goes back to that whole idea that like anything that you achieve, it's only been through him because of his wisdom. He knows best. But if we put this in like um, in the relationship of a parent and a child, mm -hmm. parents are wiser than children, right? Usually. Most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time. But a good parent tries to shape and encourage their children to make good decisions, have healthy sense of self-worth and confidence and trust in themselves. But God doesn't seem to want that for us. Right. In our relationship with him, with him he wants blind obedience. Right. He doesn't want us to question anything, impart any wisdom to us, especially since in the Garden of Eden, he didn't want us to eat from the tree of knowledge, right? right. Uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, right. uh, which is the type of knowledge. So yeah. Yeah, like you said, it's just a way for him to keep control over us. Yeah, like one of the worst things that I, I I will be the first to admit that I've said this to my own kids when they say, well, why do I have to do this? Because I said so. Yeah. It's like one of the worst phrases you can say as a parent to your kid because you're not teaching them anything. Mm -hmm. You're usurping your power to control them instead of coming yeah. along next to them and saying, and trying to explain to them, here's why what you're doing is not beneficial. Or, you know, you're trying to teach yeah. a skill. It's a teaching moment. And granted, we're, we're human and there's going to be times where we're going to not <laughs> take every teaching moment as a teaching moment. We're human, but God is God. He's perfect. God should not have this problem. He shouldn't have to say, exactly. because I said so. He should say, oh, well, here's why, blah, blah, blah. Let me help you understand yada, yada. And not only that, he should impart that to us in a personal way. You know, if we're actually having a relationship with him. Right. A clear way. One that's not open to interpretation. Where, yes, it shouldn't be guesswork. Right. I can look at a Bible verse one way and then the guy down the street who's a different version of Christian can look at the same verse and say, oh, no, God told me it's this way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, it's no coincidence that there are lots of abuse, abusive parents and those abusive parents do isolate their kids. They don't want those kids to move out mm. a lot of the time. They want their kids to remain dependent on them. They don't want their kids to make their own decisions or be mentally healthy or self-sufficient. Right. So there's a lot of parallels between an abusive parent and God. Yeah, for sure. All right, next one. I don't know. This one seems like it's a pretty obvious one on both sides. But again, it's like one of those things that it's like... You didn't even say what it is. I didn't get there yet. I'm leading up to it. <laughs> So okay. it's jealousy, extreme jealousy of your friends or time spent away from them. So in the world of human relationships, I feel like everybody knows that jealousy is a red flag in their rational mind. But then when it happens in, a, in an abusive relationship, there's always an explanation of why that jealousy isn't the bad type of jealousy. Oh, it's just because he loves me he so loves much. He loves me so much. He wants to spend time with me. Anytime you see jealousy, it's always bad. Like there's no kind of jealousy that is good. But in Christianity, you see the word jealous related to God, and then you see Christians explain away what the word jealous means. So in Exodus, it says, you shall worship no other God for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. You don't even have to read between the lines there. I no. mean, they just come right out and admit it. So well, how do Christians explain away this, the jealous part? Well, it's the same way that an abusive boyfriend or husband would say. Because he loves us so much. Yeah, he loves me so much that he doesn't want me to worship another God because he knows those gods are false and he only has my best interest in mind. Again, which goes back to the one before, he knows better than me. And again, jealousy is also about power and control. Like all of these things are about power and control. Yeah. So we have a few more. Well, this kind of goes with the jealousy thing, but preventing or discouraging you from spending time with friends, family members, or peers that's quite obviously to isolate you from from your own support system. Right. But this is also like so evident in the Bible when Jesus even says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Yeah. Because you know what? They're distractions. Mm -hmm. They're going to distract from you being fully committed and devoted to me. Right. I always thought that that verse was really harsh when I read it as a kid, as a Christian. Yeah. I always had heard Christians explain that one away by saying, it doesn't really mean hate. It means that if you love God so much, it's going to seem like you hate all of your 
brothers and sisters and like whatever. It's like the rationalizing is just. But if you really love someone, it doesn't mean that everyone else that you have interactions with feels like hate. That's ridiculous. That doesn't even make rational sense, but it sounded good as a Christian. But now you look at it, you're like, it says hate. If it doesn't mean hate, they shouldn't put hate in there. Right, (laughs) right. Yeah. And you see that also in Corinthians where Paul was saying, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or fellowship has light with darkness. Yeah. And we see that unequally yoked, mostly in terms of romantic partnerships, mm-hmm. right? Like marriages. Right. But I, I don't think it has to be, right? Is, is it only to pertaining to that or can it be just friendships? That's the main place where that verse is cherry picked to be used, you know, because like obviously you can't yeah. have a healthy relationship if you're not both under the Jesus umbrella. <laughs> right, the Jesus umbrella. If you take it further than that, then you can't have any kind of yoking or relationship with anybody that is an unbeliever because... Bad company ruins good morals. Right, there's no fellowship there. And the only reason to encourage relationship with other people, outsiders, is so you can convert them. That's the only reason. So every, yeah, right. everything mm-hmm. has to be evangelism. So you can say, oh yeah, I was evangelizing. And churches, churches take this to the nth degree, like they're isolating. They don't want you interacting with anybody outside unless you're witnessing or evangelizing. Everything is warfare. Yeah. God Questions has some of the most nauseating articles I've ever yeah. come across. So I always have to go go look at them right. to see what they have to say about these things. Well, this God Questions article said people are divided into only two categories, right? Only two. Only two in the whole world. Yeah. Those who belong to the world and its ruler, Satan. Hello. And those who belong to God. Wow. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, talk about the ultimate dichotomy. Like, it's no wonder that these people think everything is black and white. Yeah. So if if a person is not solidly in Christianity and maybe even in your sect of Christianity, depending on who you are. Right. They're of Satan. (laughs) Right. Some Christians will say, oh, well, I don't believe that version. I'm sorry that that church that you went to thinks that. That's not what we Uh. think here. (laughs) That's still Christianity. It's more biblical. Yeah, really it is. It's like if you actually take the Bible for what it says, yeah. you have to believe that. If people say that, that, oh, that's not the Christianity I follow, well, congratulations, you made up your own Christianity <laughs> that has nothing own. to do with the Bible. Right. And, Call it something else. Yeah, and that's uh, that's exactly why there's 40,000 versions of it. Yeah. Next red flag. This is a good one. Yeah. Misogyny. Oh. So, yeah, we see this in abusive relationships all the time. I mean, abuse can go both ways, right? Either gender to either gender. Yes. But when we see it from male to female, it's based in misogyny. Yes. The male is demeaning to the woman. What do you think in the Bible? Are women considered inferior to men or oh. equal? What do you think, Phil? Well, according <laughs> according to the Super Bowl, he gets us. Jesus was all about equality for women. But if you look in the Bible, not so much. It doesn't quite tell the same story. Like women are property. They couldn't mm, yeah. speak in church. They can't teach a man. If you're on your period, holy shit, you better go outside and live in a tent tent. for the duration of your period. And then you have to go and do a cleansing ritual and yada, yada, yada. If women were equal in the Bible, that stuff wouldn't be there. Some people say, oh, that's just cultural and yada, yada. No, wrong. Like, (laughs) look at Paul's and just read the New Testament and Paul and you'll see misogyny. And Paul was the worst. (laughs) He was awful. Yeah. But going back to the Old Testament, did you know about the part where when women give birth to a baby boy, they're unclean for a certain amount of time? Oh, right. And then when they give birth to a baby girl, they're unclean for twice the amount of yeah, time. Yeah, it was like twice as much time. It was like seven days yeah, as a boy. Yeah, twice or, more time. Wait, twice two a, times more time. <laughs> twice as much time. Two times more time. <laughs> yeah. Twice as much time. Times. Times two. But yeah, so like you see all you see all these little sit- subtle patriarchal things uh-huh. in there and that stuff all translates into like Christian relationships now. I mean, look at look at the freaking Duggars. Mm-hmm. I can't remember which one got convicted, you know, for child abuse and child pornography. Oh, that was Josh Duggar. His wife's like, oh, it's cool. I'm going to stay with him. Like, you know, if I if my wife found out that I abs- abused my sister, I'm pretty sure she's out the fucking door. Oh, yeah. And you see this in Christian marriages because they think divorce is so bad. Yeah. Well, I'm called to be, he's the head and yada, yada. So I'm just going to stick with it. I don't care if he's addicted to porn. I don't care if he's beaten me. I don't care if he's cheating on me with the strippers. It doesn't matter, you know, because he's the head of the household and it's my duty to submit. Yeah. On a personal level, growing up, 
there were like slight undertones of, I don't want to say like sexism, but we were treated differently. Like I was treated differently from my brother uh -huh. in some small ways, but overall things were pretty equal. And I had a conversation with my dad uh, recently and I was telling him about all the places in the Bible where women were treated like property. They were, you know, second class citizens. Right. They had no rights. And he said, he said, oh no, he's like, women and men are equal. And I was like, okay, obviously I'm glad that you're saying that, but you are more moral than your Bible. Right. Like, do you even know what's in there? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then also what, what would happen if you said, oh, so is mom allowed to preach in our church? Right. I wish I could have continued that conversation yeah. with him, but our food came yeah. and then all the other people came with like the hot dogs. Right. So <laughs> we had to stop. Hot dogs threw you off again. <laughs> yeah. Damn those hot dogs. But yeah, that's the whole thing is like a lot of Christians will say, oh, no, there's no difference between men and women. They just have different roles. That's another good sugarcoating. Oh, a woman has a different role to be a helpmeet and to be a supporter. Uh, that's not equality. You can't. It's your role to be the lesser one. Right. It's your role to be <laughs> subordinate. It's cool. Like, it, yeah, yeah. It doesn't make you less. It just makes you subordinate. And you don't have the freedom to do what you want. Right. A man can go out, get whatever job he wants. The woman has to stay home. Right. And bear children and support the man, make his lunches. Right. Have dinner ready when he gets home. Yeah. Clean the toilets, etc. Anyway, red flag, mistake misogyny or really any kind of gender inequality in a human side you see the same thing mm -hmm. in christianity you see misogyny you see patriarchy another red flag so in the human world this red flag is related to sexuality you know where one person in the relationship is pressured to have sex or do sexual acts that they're not comfortable with that is abuse like Marital rape mm -hmm. is a thing. Yeah. These are all things that are red flags in human relationships. To me, the parallel for this in the um, Christian relationship is purity culture. Purity culture is basically mandating morality and making a person be controlled by morals and dictates around how they view their own body, how they use their own body around their sexuality. Yeah. To me, purity culture, I think, is probably the most destructive thing in addition to child indoctrination about Christianity. Purity culture is not as in every sect of Christianity. Like, I don't know how purity culture was in your upbringing in Lutheranism. It wasn't as focused on as other denominations and stories that I've been hearing from other people. It was definitely present, but it was not to that extent that I've been hearing. Right. Yeah. Like April Ajoy tells some really good purity yeah. culture stories about how she had to you know, sign a second virginity pledge if she was yeah, at the no, college that she was that. at. But like that whole idea of controlling a person and their, again, God-given sexual desires. Right. But you can't use them. And then again, to go back to the first one, look at the inequality, the way purity culture is levied on women versus men. This is not a blanket statement because there's a lot of horror stories I've heard about men in purity culture. But look at what they did with women and how they viewed if you had sex before marriage. You were stoned in the Old Testament. <laughs> you were stoned for one. But in the modern times, like, oh, you're a flower with no petals. You're a crinkled oh. up, used, wrinkled, old, dirty dollar. Yeah. And all the ways that they just made women women feel like shit for their own sexuality. And, but if you were a guy, that's just how guys are. And oh, by the way, women are responsible for policing the men's morality. So you can't wear a short skirt. That's the thing. Yeah. Let me see your bra strap because it might cause me to stumble. That's the part I didn't have. We wore spaghetti strap tank tops in my church all the time. Not like in the service, but like youth group. Right. But we did have the idea that like, oh, you can't have sex before marriage. So they told us when not to have sex. Mm -hmm. And then this wasn't like um, impressed upon me, but I've heard this, that after you're married, it's your duty to satisfy your husband whenever he wants it. You right. can't say no. Right. That's your purpose. Yeah. Thankfully, that was never pushed on me. <laughs> and then if the husband goes out and cheats, you'll even hear pastors ask the wives, mm. well, were you meeting his sexual needs? What did you do wrong? And well, of course he stepped out. You weren't giving him what he needed. Like, yeah, it's coming back to the inferior party and like, what did you do wrong? Right. The victim shaming. It's your fault. Yeah. The victim shaming and the one who has the power is maintaining control of the situation by keeping that the victim lower. Yeah. And so God and the church do this, the same thing with Christians and their views about purity and sexuality. And it's not even just actually acting on it. It's also thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Lustful thoughts. Yeah. The Bible says if you think about a woman in a lustful manner, 
you might as well have already committed adultery with her or sexual uh, or fornication with her or whatever. So not mm-hmm. only are your actual actions being policed, but your thoughts are being policed too. Like, which is exactly what an abusive human would do to their partner. You can't even look at another guy like and to expand on the human metaphor it's almost like if the if the man in the relationship gave the woman all these desires and then withheld it from her right because that's what god is doing right like right. god created humans with these desires and then made so many rules about it right it set us up to fail yeah it's like putting a kid in willy wonka's chocolate factory and then yes. saying hey you can't have any candy oh and you can look at the candy but don't even think about the candy but don't think about it you should only be thinking about me while you're in this candy store yes you know it has a really really good analogy to like show how ridiculous it is yeah to give humans sex drives and then expect them right to not think about sex right ever right crazy yeah that's definitely a red flag in human and in the the christianity side mood swings and a short temper another good red flag <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm laughing. I know. I'm thinking about the snakes again. Yeah. Well, so like this kind of goes with your next point about threats of violence. So maybe we, let's put these all together. So like mood swings, okay. short temper, threats of violence all go together because yeah. at one one second, God is love. But then right on the flip side, it's like, mm, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe me. Or if you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you're, you're fucking you're dead. dead. If you lie about how much money you're giving to the church. Boom, you're dead. If you ask for more food, right. you will have snakes thrown at you yeah. by an angry God. I love what when is I that ask for about? things that I get snakes thrown at uh, me. Like, <laughs> venomous snakes, too. Of course. That. Well, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't want to use yeah. like garter snakes. That's that's not going to do anything. Have you read? Oh, well, of course you have because you read the whole Bible. But I haven't. And <laughs> I recently came across Deuteronomy 28 which is amazing. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. It's it's a real happy reading. Well, the first half is happy. The first half describes what will happen if the Israelites follow God's commandments. So many blessings will befall them if they just listen. This is the mood swing thing. This This is the the mood swings going on, right? The upside of the bipolar God. Yeah. Okay. So the second half of the chapter describes what will happen if they don't follow his commandments, including, but not limited to, painful and curable boils from head to toe. Job got those. Dust and powder falling from the sky until you all are destroyed. Wait, what the kind what kind of dust and powder causes you to be destroyed? <laughs> like what the fuck? It said rain will fall in the form of dust and powder. Or the rain will be dust and powder. So I don't oh, know. Oh, that's fantastic. I, who knows? It doesn't even make any sense. It's like death rain. That's awesome. Yeah. A wasting disease with fever and inflammation, scorching heat and drought. Perfect. And as if as if the boils and the the wasting disease weren't enough. That will be followed with madness, blindness, confusion of mind. Another man will go rape your wife. Oh, Jesus. Your sons and daughters will go into captivity. And I'm assuming that means slavery, right? Oh, I would imagine. And then I'm not sure how this works because I thought the sons and daughters went into slavery. But then you will eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters. God is going to force them to be cannibals. This is in the Bible. But God's love. It reminds me of that George Carlin skit. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, we'll send you to hell or forever. Send you to burn for hell forever. He, like, loves, he you. loves you. Yeah. Oh, we should link to that one in our in the show notes too. Yeah, that's fantastic. Totally. I, I love how he does that together. But yeah. yeah, it's like, and that's just totally a red flag in in the abusive relationship too. Everything is hunky dory as long as you do what I tell you. Yeah. The minute you don't do what I tell you or make me unhappy, you're gonna wish you were dead. Right. Shit is gonna hit the fan. It, I think this is really summed up pretty well in the last few verses. If you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, he will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary disasters, severe and lasting plagues, and terrible and chronic sicknesses. Oh, perfect. He will afflict you again with all the diseases you dreaded in Egypt, and they will cling to you. (laughs) The Lord will also bring upon you every sickness and plague not recorded in this book of the law until you are destroyed. But wait, there's more. You who were as numerous as the stars in the sky will be left few in number because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and multiply, so also it will please him to annihilate you and destroy you. Wow. I mean, I don't even know what more there is to say about that. I like how he brings up Egypt. It's like it's like exactly what an abusive partner would do. Like, remember how it was last time you did this shit? God's like, oh, yeah. Remember what I did to you in Egypt? I fucked you up and I'll do it again. Remember the snakes? Yeah. Remember the snakes? Remember the plagues? Remember that? Man, that is 
Isn't that great? Wow. I feel like, how can you read that and not be an atheist after that? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. So I think we made a pretty solid case that yeah. if you're in a relationship with God, it's not a good one. No. You might want to think about getting out. <laughs> this is where I think we differ a little bit from Bart in our episode where he's like, oh, I'm, I'm okay. Like leaving people in there, you know, if it's not hurting them. Well, if it's not hurting you mm-hmm. now, it's going to hurt you at some point. Yeah, I'm not sure how I can be okay with just yeah. kind of leaving someone happy and oblivious in their unhealthy relationship. I wouldn't do it in a human world, right? Well, the problem is that when you do try to engage somebody who's in an abusive relationship and they refuse to see it, they can't see it. And so oftentimes that d- just drives them further, you know, closer to their abuser. Right. And so I think the same thing happens with Christianity. They double down. The next kind of section we want to talk about is like, well, what are you getting out of the relationship versus what are you putting into it? And this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of it being one way traffic. Yeah. So what do they think they're getting out of it? So there's a couple couple of things that I feel like Christians feel like they're getting out of. And I put the word perceive before all of these things. And maybe we can talk about if these things are like real or if they're just figments of the imagination. So the first one for me, perceived hope in every situation. Oh, yeah. There's no situation that you're going to encounter that you have to like worry about or feel sadness about or grief because you have God. Or that like everything happens for a reason. God has a plan that that, all those platitudes that come with the God belief. Yeah, that's powerful. If you think about it, I can understand why someone would want that because there's a lot of shit that happens in the world that sucks. Who wouldn't want an easy button? Oh, the easy button. Yeah, Boop. that was easy. <sighs> yeah, I'll just give it to God. You know, like, yeah, I, I was never one of those people that when I encountered something difficult, I turned to God. Yeah, I, I guess that's why it was easier for me to leave because I never was like dependent on this relationship in any way. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly why it's so hard for people sometimes to let go yeah. of that. Because who who wouldn't want to have hope in every situation? That's one thing they feel they're getting out of it. This is my favorite term. I love this. Perceived afterlife insurance. <laughs> so do you think that's to avoid hell or do, the, do you think people actually really want heaven? I think it's a little of both because, you know, there's a lot of Christians n- nowadays that have deconstructed the idea of hell. So they don't believe that there's hell. So hell is definitely a motivator for some people. I don't want to go to hell, but then you've got the promise of heaven. So even if there is no hell, there's still heaven for people who don't believe in hell. But this is definitely a perceived benefit. Like who wouldn't want that? I'm all for avoiding hell if hell is a thing. I mean, I don't believe it is obviously, but heaven never seemed all that great to me. (laughs) I'm Yeah. It was always described to me as like worship. Right. I imagined it was just singing hymns all day. And I do like to sing hymns. Right. (laughs) But (laughs) not all day. I mean, all day, never ending. Right. Day after day, forever. Yeah, that might get old. Yeah. But of course, they would say, oh, you you wouldn't think so because you'll have a glorified mind and body and all that stuff. So. Okay. So I'm not me then. Yeah. It would be natural for you to just praise and worship. That's not me. That's some other robot version of me. Right. So what's the point of me right now? Yeah. How about perceived protection from the outside world? Oh, so this is like what we were saying before with the outside world is scary. Right. I think you see this a lot in people who see spiritual something in every situation, like your phlebotomist, like everything is spiritual. Yeah. Everything is an object lesson and I have Jesus to protect me or the Holy Spirit or the armor of God to protect me. So I don't have to worry about those things infiltrating my life because I'm protected. I guess I don't really understand this because if you don't believe in God, then you don't believe in spiritual warfare, but you're believing in God because you believe in spiritual warfare. And so God is appealing to you. It's like kind of circular. Yeah, it definitely is kind of circular. But I think it goes to the whole idea of like, when you believe in this us versus them thing, then everything is us versus them. And it's me on the inside protected by God and Jesus and the church and all that. And everything else out there is an enemy. And because I have the Holy Spirit, I'm protected from that stuff. Oh, okay. So you're saying like, there's a good there. So there's two sides. You want to be on the winning side. Right. That's what you're saying. It's the winning side. Okay, yes. got it. 
Yes, protection. Winning is a good way to put it. Yeah, I've got it right. So I don't have to worry about all the bad shit that's going to happen. It's like with Thor's sister, like that one guy who sided with Thor's sister because he thought she was the winning side, mm. even though he didn't really like totally jive with her methods. Right. <laughs> and then at the end, he defected. But it's like that. It's like he had to choose a side and he chose the side where he thought he had a better chance of survival. Of survival. Yeah. So it's a lot about self-protection. And and then I think the last benefit I think that Christians would say they get out is you have like this perceived unfettered access to divine intelligence and guidance through the Bible and prayer and yeah, but you can feel like it's a manual for your life, right? Absolutely, like an instruction booklet. I mean, life did not come with an instruction booklet, right? Like we didn't evolve with one; we had to work it out on our own. But like, yeah, I guess you, I see what you mean. That is kind of appealing just to have one dropped in your lap. Yeah, here's a moral guidebook for you. I remember have, as a kid having some kind of book that was like, here are all the Bible verses about friendship. Right. And so if I was having a problem mm-hmm. about, about my friends, I would just go to that and flip through and see all right. the verses about friendship. Yeah, yeah. Funny how they, they were never like, uh, be careful not to take this out of context. Right. That's what a lot of people do. Like, you know, they pull right. a verse out and you use it. And then if you use it in the way that they don't agree with, they say, oh, you're taking it out of context. Right. Yeah. That's it's kind of funny. We can put a whole bunch of verses together to use in a, in a quick draw. In a situation, yeah. but then if you but did, that's, that's not out of context, right? No, no, that's, that's how it was designed to be used. But then if you use right. a verse like Deuteronomy, whatever, oh, you're taking it yeah. out of context. Exactly. That's not what he meant. He didn't really mean, eat, what he, meant. he didn't mean eat your own kids. Like he was <laughs> making an analogy to, <laughs> it was an analogy yeah, to so, eating your own kids. All right. So, so we can say, okay, the Christians are getting something out of the relationship. They feel like. What are they putting into the into the relationship? Literally everything. <laughs> their whole life. Their whole life is what they're putting into it. Their free will. Right. Their whole life and identity is wrapped up in Jesus and their faith. And then what's God actually doing? Well, there's no evidence that God's actually done anything. Right. He's literally doing nothing. Like you can extrapolate that God helped you find your car keys, but there's no proof. The, exactly. So again, it kind of reinforces the idea that the relationship that a Christian says they have is not really a relationship. It's a one-sided thing for sure. Which to me is delusional. And it's sad. I think it's really sad that they're devoting their life to something that they're going to get nothing out of in the end, except they've gone through their life thinking that they're abysmal people and that they're failing. Right. Because nobody is ever going to reach the perfection of God. Right. And yet that's what they think they're supposed to do. And even if you went through life feeling like that you were a joyful, happy Christian, because you basically have pushed down the idea of like, I'm a sinner, just destined for hell. To me, you're going to get to the end of life. You're still not going to know that you were wrong because you'll be dead. Yeah. And you'll have wasted all your Sunday mornings. Right. You could have been having waffles. No shit. Waffles. You missed out on brunch. <laughs> because you were so early for worship team practice. Did we notice any of this stuff when we were Christians? No. I don't think I noticed any of the things that we've talked about so far as being negatives. Like I think I knew some of the things on some level that I was kind of unconsciously aware of but definitely not in any sort of way that I could have verbalized it to anybody or I could have used it to formulate actual thoughts. Yeah. But I was always aware of the fact that God held us responsible for something that wasn't our fault. Yeah. And in that way, I guess I was aware of that type of, but I didn't see it as as abuse. I just thought, well, this is weird. Like, I don't understand this part of Christianity. I didn't equate it to abuse. Yeah, yeah. How do Christians respond to some of these things that we would have said? Okay. I combed through Reddit because Reddit is a great place for debates. Yes. I collected a lot of the things that Christians were saying about why these arguments that the argument, the case that we just made, why that's not valid. Right. One of the ones I thought was interesting was that it's not abuse because God is being honest when he says these things, while the abusive boyfriend is lying when he says those things. What? So it's not abuse if it's true. Oh. Basically. Okay. So God is wiser than us. It is our fault. Right, right. We are sinners. Right? He's like, yeah. He's like, it's true though. It's- so it's not abuse. Okay. I've definitely heard people say that like, oh, well, it's true. I can't argue with God. I don't make the rules. Yeah. That won't convince us, obviously. Like you have to be a Christian to accept that right. argument. Right. But why does that make it better? <laughs> it doesn't. If those things are true, and that is the way God made it, he set up an abusive relationship. Right. 
And that doesn't make it not abusive. It right. just means that he did it on purpose and all those things are true. That's even more sadistic if he did it intentionally. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, this is another good one that God's not human. So we shouldn't anthropomorphize his motives and actions. You know, that's the whole. Well, I don't understand. This one doesn't make sense to me. Why can you only be abusive if you're human? Right. If humans can be abused, then any entity can do the abusing to a human. Right. But that's just a way of sweeping it under the rug. It, yeah. It's a thought terminating cliche. His yeah. ways are higher than I way, our ways. That's it. We're done. So what do you think about this one? Since God created us, it's only natural that we are nothing without him. I mean, I <laughs> guess. But if God is supposedly loving, why would he make us create us to be nothing? Create us to be nothing. Like, what good does that do him? Yeah. Like, unless he's just yeah. a sadistic power hungry. He created us to be dependent on him right. in you the way an abusive parent does not want their children to become self-sufficient. Yeah. Or it's just basically like, you know, an evil genius guy who just creates like a robot army to control and go out mm -hmm. and conquer the world or whatever. It's like, oh, no, 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 because we have free will. We're not robots. Well, I, yeah, I'm just making the analogy of like, no, I'm just joking. Not the control <laughs> part, like as far as free will. But yeah, you just create, of course, they're less than because I made you. I just thought of this nightmare before Christmas, that evil scientist who made Sally. Yeah. Is she nothing without him? He made her and he was totally abusive to her. He did not want her to leave. Right. He isolated her. He did not want her talking to anybody else. Right. She served him. That was her purpose. Yeah. Wow. I, mean, I wish I had thought of this earlier. I could have came up with a whole bunch of Nightmare Before Christmas bullet points. Jack Skellington uh, references. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another one is that the, ver you know, you mentioned this earlier that the verse interpretation is out of context. And so it doesn't apply. Oh, yeah. You're just taking, you're apply. just taking it out of context. That's a classic one. That's a really good thought terminating cliche right there. Yeah, absolutely. Cause it just shuts off the, the conversation. Yeah. Well, tell me what the context is then for Deuteronomy 28. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> the whole chapter is taken out of context. Yeah. Um, so can a pot say to the potter, you don't respect me enough <laughs> or you aren't using me as I want you to No. The potter can use his pots however he wishes. A pot has no value beyond what the potter makes it for. So we are not valuable beyond how God values us. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. We are not pots. Right. Hey, but it says in the Bible that he was the potter, we're the clay. And then there's other verses where it says, you know, we're like earthen vessels, you know, waiting to okay. be filled. But imagine that pots were sentient creatures. Right. And that every pot we made sprang to life, right. but we still only use them to cook food. Don't you think that at some point there would be some kind of uprising of the pots? It'd be an uprising of the pots. They would be totally in the right to right. have an uprising. Yeah, the pot was made and then it ha it's sentient and has a whole bunch of things that it can do besides hold stew. Yeah. Like this pot <laughs> could cure cancer. You've been making me hold stew for 30 years. Yeah. I'm about to yeah. go ape shit on you. Like not a good analogy. No, it's a terrible analogy. No, humans are sentient creatures with inherent self-worth feelings and emotions. So yeah, we're not pots. No. So I found this very interesting. All these rationalizations that people really go to great lengths to, to protect God from these accusations. And why are they doing this? I came across a very interesting reason. Do you know about Stockholm syndrome? Yeah, oh, for sure. And I've seen people use this analogy for how Christians stay in Christianity. Go for it. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, it's very applicable. So Stockholm syndrome is feelings of trust or affection felt in many cases of kidnapping or hostage taking by a victim toward a captor. There's a really good, um, how do you say that? Pathios? Path yeah, Pathios. I think Pathios so. article? Yeah. We'll link to it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but it says, when victims see themselves as helpless, unable to escape, they begin to believe that their only chance for survival is the goodwill of their captor. Even small kindnesses shown to them become, in their minds, evidence that the captor is not so bad. And for their own sake, they begin to make an effort to keep the captor happy and fulfill his desires. Over time, this can grow into an actual emotional bond that ultimately leads to the captive taking their captor's side. Stockholm Syndrome frequently appears among prisoners of war, members of cults, and other similar situations but most significantly, it is very common in abusive relationships. Police officers called to incidents of domestic violence often find that the abused partner will take the side of the person who was abusing or beating her just moments prior, sometimes even to the point of physically assaulting the officer attempting to arrest the abuser. Yeah, and I, I've been through training on this because of my job and I've been overseas. So I've gone through training on like what happened, what you should do if you get captured or whatever. And they talk about this a lot about how if your captivity goes on for a certain period of time, 
this is a very real problem. And so you have to do things to maintain your mental strength. So that way you don't succumb to Stockholm syndrome. Mm. That's exactly what happens in, in Christianity. You've basically fell in love with your captor. And you hear about this with cult leaders. I mean, Charles Manson had girls like you know, writing to him in prison. And yeah, this happens all the time. So it, it does happen all the time. So I think, yeah, it's a it's a phenomenon that happens across all of humanity. Nobody's probably safe from it. Right. Yeah. Especially when you're up against something that feels like you're powerless against it. And your only chance of survival is to join it, get on its good side. Right. That's what you're going to do. To wrap this up, like, how do you interact with people or how should we interact with people who are in an abusive relationship with God? It's not real, but how do you, how do you deal with them? Because it's real to them. It's real to them. So they're still getting the harms of, of an abusive relationship, but I'm not sure there's much you can do besides just be a safe space for them so that when maybe they do start to realize some of these things that they can come to you and have a safe spot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is, it's a tough thing because you really, you're concerned about people that are in this situation. Like if it was a human relationship, you would probably figure out some way to educate them or point to them like, Hey, like the situation you're in is not healthy. It's not good for you. Like, so even being subtle in your way of pointing out to people like, Hey, maybe this isn't the best way to look at something. Maybe it'll plant that idea in their head that like, Oh, maybe I should look at this a little bit more critically. I, I find myself doing this a little bit more now when I see someone post something that's just really overtly disturbing. I just have to go in there and, and say, have you ever thought about it this way? Which I think is something Bart said to like asking a question. Yeah. He was giving some examples of like talking to your teenage daughter about her boyfriend who's not so good for her right. and just asking her questions and getting her to think about how he's really treating her and what does he value in her and those sorts of things. And that's possible that maybe if those types of questions can help elucidate for the person who's in this abusive relationship that it's not all as hunky dory as it seems to be on the surface. Right. It's really sinister yeah. when you get down under the surface. Well, and I think that's the value kind of like of talking about this stuff. Cause like, like for me, I had never thought about my relationship with God as being an abusive relationship. Now, granted, I was already kind of like moving down the path to deconstruction. So I was more open to listening to a, like a podcast like this that talks about it. But having this stuff out there, we don't know who's going to hear it. So maybe there's somebody listening to this right now saying, oh, I'm right at the point where this makes sense, you know, and mm -hmm. then it can put them in touch with people that will help them kind of elucidate, like you said, what, what situation they're actually in as opposed to what they want their situation to be. So yeah, hopefully that's what this does. It helps people kind of see what they're involved in and get help if they feel that that's what they need to do at the time. It's, you can't force it on somebody. Like no. One other point that really sticks out to me in this whole discussion is the Christian response that oh, it's not abuse if it's true. <laughs> that to me just shows how abusive it is because they actually believe that God, an all-knowing entity, created, created organisms that are conscious, sentient, have drives and emotions, created them so flawed that they couldn't possibly live up to his impossible standards. Right. Who will be tortured forever if they don't. Right. And if they don't, if they don't believe this one tiny thing on no evidence, that system is so effed up. Yeah. It itself is abusive. Like it doesn't even matter if it's true or it's not true. If this is what you believe and this is what you believe happened, that's abusive. There's no two ways about it. Right. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. Yeah. And what it boils down to is that it doesn't matter if it's a human or a god doing the abusing. The ethics are the same. Right. And if you have the ability to create life, then you have a moral responsibility to take care of that life, make it responsibly. Right. You know, do it ethically like Spider-Man, right? <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. Right. So don't just create this life so that you can walk all over it. Yeah. That's definitely not what a loving deity would do. And I think the last thing I want to say is like, if you, I know this isn't the point of this episode, but if you are in an actual human abusive relationship, there are resources and ways to get help and hotlines and resources. So we'll put some of those in the show notes as well, because you are not alone out there. You deserve better. Yeah. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to be abused. We, do, we want you to get help and be safe. So we'll put that 
uh, in the show notes as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. Tune in next time where we will continue to tackle the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? Be sure to join us on our Facebook group, Dangerous Questions, and follow us at flawedtheologypodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Rate and review the podcast on Google, Spotify, Apple. Those uh, reviews are really cool and we like to hear from them. So until next time, keep asking the dangerous questions. See you next time. Wait, Once you get my... done bunning yourself. It's not a bun this time. Oh, you punny tailed. <laughs> so speaking of bunning, you know, my oldest is in synchronized swimming. Really? So she has to do all this stuff to her hair. So earlier, like right before I came down here, my wife is up there putting her hair into a bun and then gelling it with gelatin. So her hair was like rock hard with just gelatin. So at least <laughs> you don't have to do that to your hair. Do you? I don't understand. Wait, why does she, her hair have to be like that in the pool? Because the gelatin is waterproof. They don't wear caps, and so okay. the gelatin like holds the style. Gotcha. So that was a long story to say. At least you don't have to gelatin your bun. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was like the weirdest story. The Great Rabbit Trail. We'll just put that in the outtakes, and uh, we'll talk about <laughs> gelatinous buns. Gelatinous buns. Yeah, another great band name too. So <laughs> because it sounds like you're an ass, not like buns on your head. Right. Not not hair buns. We're talking about not hair buns. Right. Gelatinous ass buns. <laughs> Gelatinous ass buns. That's fantastic. Now we're going to have to make this episode like NSFW because we said gelatinous <laughs> ass buns and someone's going to be listening to us in their, in their office and they're going to be like, the hell is gelatinous ass buns? Like, <laughs> and she's on the floor. <laughs> All right, well, oh we're going to have to take a brief commercial update while Susie recovers. Are you good? I'm good. Stuff this yo yo away. Right? Just as long as I don't think about that, like randomly pop into my head. Right. Gelatin his ass buns in the middle of the episode. Like a really deep part of the conversation that's going to pop yeah. into your head. You're just going to laugh inappropriately. Yep. At least I know what it'll be about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's do the intro and then we'll get this, get this popping. Okay. Sorry. If you're not ready. <laughs> All right. I'm good. Let's go. All right. Ready? Let's go. All right. Yeah. Hi, welcome to the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. And we're asking the question, if your theology were real, wouldn't you want to know? You want to say that again? Why? You said if your theology were real. <laughs>